Hello and welcome to all of you joining us today. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. I'm Joanne Joseph. I'll be facilitating the discussion we're about to have this morning. As you may be aware, the Business Day Cannabis Economy in partnership with Afriplex is kicking off a series of seminars starting today on the role of cannabis in rebuilding South Africa's economy. Now, the webinars as a whole will focus on the key aspects driving the development of this new economy. And the experts we've gathered today will fill you in on the fundamentals that make up the international and local cannabis economy. First, though, here's some important information that provides a backdrop to our conversation today. Afriplex is a proudly South African-based company that was established in 2001 in Paul, Western Cape. The name Afriplex is rooted in the company's history of African plant extraction, offering a full turnkey solution for our clients in services from product development, contract manufacturing and packaging to quality control testing and final product dispatch. As the first licensed cannabis processor in South Africa, proudly offer our clients the very best product solutions in the industry. Our reputation is backed by more than 20 years of scientific research into the beneficial uses of African plant species. Afriplex's 6,000 square meter Safra GMP certified facility is staffed by more than 250 well-trained personnel who work in various areas, including a dedicated research and development team of scientists and pharmacists that explores various novel cannabis and cannabinoid research projects. We have state-of-the-art on-site laboratories, in-house stability chambers to conduct self-life studies, providing our clients with confidence in their products. Afriplex is a proud member of the Cannabis Research Institute of South Africa. This dedication ensures that our customers get the best range of product solutions that is available on the market. We are a quality service driven company that likes to be on the forefront of both modern medicine and technology in the pharmaceutical, complementary medicines, cannabis, veterinary, food and beverage industries. Afriplex proprietary cannabis extraction process has been developed leveraging 20 years experience in the industry, allowing for optimized processing that is safe, efficient and cost effective. We offer a comprehensive range of high quality cannabis extracts, either as full spectrum, broad spectrum or as an isolate. The development and offering of novel plant extracts opens the door to formulations which give your product the competitive edge. The facility includes our dedicated cannabis manufacturing and filling rooms. These rooms are designed with its own HVAC system to guarantee separation from the other products we produce on site. Our standard operating procedures, coupled with a modern ERP and track and trace system, allows for complete traceability throughout the manufacturing process. Our track and trace system does not start or end at our primary manufacturing facility, but is extended to our dedicated cultivators to ensure the highest quality from seed to shelf, giving our customers the reassurance that they receive the product proven to meet the most stringent regulatory and quality requirements. Afriplex takes a personalized approach to every client and each individual product. You would be hard pressed to find an African company that can offer you an entire solution from source to shelf like Afriplex does. Afriplex, the medical standard from source to shelf. I hope that video sets the scene for what we're about to hear from our panel members. I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker. Mark Diuga is managing partner of the African Growth Fund, which is the first dedicated investment fund for cannabis in South Africa. He's also a director of Overberg Asset Management. He has overall responsibility for implementing the strategic objectives of the fund and will act as the main point of communication between the fund and its limited partners. Mark is going to focus on the importance of strategy, diversification and risk management when investing in a new industry like the cannabis one. Over to you, Mark. Brilliant. Thank you for that introduction, Joanne, and thank you again, Donnie and, and Afriflex for providing the, the platform, which, which will be a great uh, webinar series that uh, we're all looking forward to. So let me get into share my screen. Uh, hopefully this works. 
Okay, brilliant. Okay, so the, the title of my presentation, Green Gold or Fool's Gold, um, so to look at a bit of history before we move forward is to the investment case for cannabis, uh, specifically talking medical uh, cannabis in terms of the African Growth Fund, uh, and look at um, potential pitfalls of uh, what we've seen in the past in, in Canada and uh, what the opportunity is for Africa itself. Okay, so fools rush in. So Canada fully legalized cannabis in 2017, uh, creating a lot of hype around the industry, as you could imagine. Um, and the Canadians started a progressive series of uh, rolling out legislation, much like we're seeing in uh, South Africa. Um, but by 2017, three years ago, fully legalized. So every entrepreneur believed that they could start the best company uh, and get onto a, a brand new industry, being the only country globally to, to legalize cannabis. There's a get-rich-quick attitude um, for, for investors and entrepreneurs uh, and a lot of blind investment, much like if I uh, go to the horse racing, uh, I have no, no idea about which jockey, which horse to back and choose it on the name and the colour. Uh, and I think we saw a lot of that with the Canadian investment to begin with. And when we uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of new businesses, a lot of development, um, yeah, you, you get this great rise in terms of, of, of value that we saw. Uh, and then you've got an oversupply in the industry. Um, so as prices drop, given the oversupply of flour, uh, so do the share prices. And unfortunately, a lot of investors got burned along that process. Um, and we, we need to make sure that we mitigate those, uh, those failings and make sure that we, we protect investors um, from, from repeating the same mistakes of the past. But is there a case that there's still uh, an investment um, merit to be had in South Africa and Africa as a whole? Uh, what tangible impact can we expect from the industry? So if workers in the cannabis industry and related fields will outpace computer programmers, uh, which is amazing when you think of the, the NASDAQ's performance and the, the job uh, creation in, in Silicon Valley, but the, the Canadian job market expect, the cannabis, sorry, job market expected to, to reach almost a quarter of a million, uh, quarter of a million um, employees by, by year end. And then sales despite coronavirus, 15 billion uh, US dollars in the US, 40% uh, up uh, on this time last year, uh, which is tremendous. And it really supports the, the industry, the, the fact that this is a health product, wellness product, uh, and available despite the, the pandemic and then shut down. And as you have seen locally in South Africa, um, you were still able to, to pop into clicks and get your CBD products as well. So what is the, the opportunity uh, still? Uh, the UN are reporting that uh, 250 million people around the world are consuming cannabis and in one form or another. So that doesn't mean just lighting up uh, a joint, so to speak, and, uh, and, and getting that, that high. Okay. Cannabis in one form or another or hemp-related products, uh, 250 million people worldwide using, using related products. And there's so many applications for it which will We'll hear about in the course of uh, the series of webinars from medicinal properties to industrial hemp, which we've seen in South Africa, the, the slow relaxation of uh, hemp legislation back in, in May as well. So we believe that Africa has a, a, an early mover advantage in South Africa specifically. Uh, so it's not fully legalized in many parts of the world. Um, Canada set the, set the pace, the US is following, uh, although it's not federally legal yet, it is slowly rolling out in state to state, and we're seeing that happen across Europe, uh, and we're seeing South Africa get on board, and, and countries like Lesotho, Namibia, and Malawi, really building a case for Africa getting in early. Uh, and we believe that if, if you have this kind of growth in unison um, element, you, you can grow quicker um, from, a, from a similar part scale, which we'll talk about, in a minute or two's time. And what we're really expecting to see is uh, supply chain integration and communication. So unlike what we saw with a, a lot of entrepreneurs in Canada where you have uh, somebody who wants to, wants to pursue the cultivation, the farming element, you've got individuals wanting to pursue the brand uh, and create the next Red Bull, Coca-Cola type company based on cannabis. We believe that if you can integrate and stitch together the supply chain, um, then you've got the, the greater data from the supply and demand elements. So you've got, you, you understand what's going in the ground and coming out and being harvested. You understand the consumer data coming out of the demand on the other side. You can harmonize the industry and align all those interests along the journey as well as 
uh, working with software as well. So if the industry grows, uh, which we fully believe it will do over the coming years, then everybody should win if everybody's working together, uh, which is a theme of uh, our investment philosophy. We, uh, I'll only briefly touch on in the industry application. Uh, the slide took a long time to put together, and you can see that there's so much utility just from one plant, uh, which I guess as, uh, yeah, as investors, we typically look at what, what is the economic result of, of our input. Um, but if we look at actually what, what cannabis is all about, what the plant is, and, and what products can be derived from it, there's so much utility and so much value that there has to be uh, a new market created. There has to be a booming industry that comes on the back of this as long as it's, it's done correctly. It grows, grows um, homogeneously across the board and grows together. Then there's elements of going into wellness products as we know, but going into industrials through, through hemp, through hempcrete, through fibers, uh, et cetera. So can we turn those pools green? That's certainly uh, our philosophy. Um, so investors have been burnt before, we're cognizant of that, but we believe that if the, the capital is deployed and pulled together across the entire ecosystem, you create natural diversification in your investment portfolio from seed to sale, as we'll look at in the, the next slide. And we want to be working with extraordinary companies, so Afroflex Medical Cannabis, and we'll hear from, from really pharmaceuticals as well. So the companies that have got the, the greatest track record in the most comparable markets um, with a history of working in botanicals and pharmaceutical products, medical cannabis ticks both those boxes. So we want to be working with business leaders and entrepreneurs with the relevant or the, uh, you know, the most comparative relevant experience in the industry. We want to invest capital and expertise into growing that industry and focus on this vertically integrated model across the entire supply chain and learn from those mistakes of, of what went wrong. Thankfully, uh, the school fees have been paid, so to speak. Uh, the mistakes have been made in different parts of the world, so we can learn from that and really put a, uh, a valuable proposition together. Now, what's great about having a, a fund in place to, to help deploy capital is that a fund can not only do well for its investors, but you can have a, an impact element to a fund to do well as part of its mandate. Okay, so an entrepreneur is a standalone investor may want to retain capital for themselves or their own shareholders, where a fund can have a mandate in place to create jobs, to create a tangible impact, to focus on skill transfer, as well as where capital is deployed for the long term. So what we're trying to do is look at the entire supply chain of medical cannabis from seeds and genetics, so the science elements to it. And, and, and what we're hoping to, to see over time is that we can identify uniqueness with South African strains uh, and from a genetic element and there's potential for intellectual property and patents that derive from that. Throw, flowing through into cultivation, extraction, into the manufacturing side, so from growing, growing crop to, to harvesting to processing. Uh, to turning those into consumer products, to distributing that locally and route to market into Europe, the US and, and other parts of the world as well. So that's what we want to invest into uh, and it creates a, a huge opportunity to grow an industry uh, across all, all elements of the value chain. Uh, and it would also where you create that diversified portfolio within the industry itself uh, and win by the, the sum of the parts model. But as you can imagine, there's a, there's a heck of a lot is required from an in infrastructure spend uh, to get the market to where it needs to be. So we envisage the fund playing a key role in creating the market. So although we, we talk about how, how great the Afroplex business model is, and we, we see that video, it's, it's important to understand that Afroplex will, will do better if, if the market grows around it. Okay, so we need to fund the industry, create the infrastructure and have key South African businesses winning as a result of that. So we're trying to create a home for entrepreneurs and businesses to have the fund to approach for funding, to have strategy as part of the fund's mandate, uh, and to really harmonize the industry so that as an entrepreneur can approach the fund for capital, they know that they can be part of a bigger value chain uh, and be working together with other industry leaders and not working against uh, their competitors. 
So there are there's numerous companies creating a dominant South African industry, and we don't just want to, uh, we don't believe investors should be doing the same mistakes as what they did in Canada and trying to pick one winning company that may come out the other side and, and be a conglomerate of some sort. And we'd rather see a focused, uh, a diversified portfolio to just build the industry, creating a lot of valuable South African companies that win as a result, not just one or two businesses. And ultimately, we believe that the, the advancing legislation that we like to see copying models in other parts of the world to create the ability for a, a consumer or a patient, as, as you could call it, to go to their GP to receive a prescription if there's relevant uh, medical cannabis products to, to suit their needs, uh, arrive at their local dispensary and, and have that covered by their medical aid plan as well. So be able to get their, their medicinal cannabis and get the extraordinary health benefits uh, from the plant and have that covered by insurance. And take South African homegrown products to the world. We want to be locally dominant in South Africa and we want to be a player internationally and there's no reason why with the, uh, the, the cost of labor locally, the, the climate, the, the soils, the expertise in pharmaceutical as well as agriculture, why we can't be a key player in, in the world. We shouldn't just be known as, as farmers uh, in the international stage. We should create products and businesses domestically as well. Uh, and despite being from, from England, uh, the Springboks there, not to remind me of the Rugby World Cup final, but to remind me about how South Africa can be uh, can achieve more from the 15 players on the pitch. Okay, so if we can have 15 great companies in South Africa and all working for the same common goal, okay, we can really achieve something special rather than one or two, uh, one or two key players that don't have the team around them. So that's what we're we're hoping to see, uh, and, and we're we're very confident that the industry is in its infancy in South Africa and it will be significantly bigger over the coming years. So where do we go from here? So the High Court ruling decriminalized cannabis two years ago. Um, the government were, uh, were told that they needed to amend the laws around cannabis for medicinal use, religious practices, and other personal purposes. But the government ruling was uh, well, the ruling was not to, to force the government to create an industry or a marketplace. So we believe our role at the African Growth Fund is to be responsible for investors, but create the marketplace. Um, with reptile well regulated and a sustainable industry that benefits all South Africans. So, yeah, we'll talk more about impact investing, I'm sure, as uh, some of the questions filter through. But yeah, it's a huge opportunity to create a tangible impact locally, create a winning portfolio of companies rather than just one or two players, and really make sure that South Africa competes uh, globally. Um, that's what we envisage for. Um, for the African growth fund, for the industry, and the, the potential is as huge as we'll hear about through um, the other presentations and future webinars. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much for that, Mark, and that thank you for laying the basis for a sound understanding of how to go about investing in this industry. All right, next, I'd like to introduce Sean Willard. He's a pharmacist, holistic cannabis practitioner, and national training and PR manager for Relief Pharmaceuticals. Sean has a range of experiences in the working world, extending from running his own pharmacies, uh, turning around failing businesses to a stint in the tourism industry as well. Sean is going to share with us his knowledge of CBD and the potential health benefits. He'll also look at the issue from the point of view of a consumer and a potential entrepreneur. Welcome, Sean. Thank you so much, Joanne, and uh, thank you to Dani and to, to Afriplex for putting on this uh, this webinar. I think it really is an idea whose time has come, as it were, and um, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Thank you so much for an informative talk there, Mark, uh, spe specifically honing on that on that Springbok victory, but I won't go any further than that. But um, yeah, so thanks, thanks everybody. And I think, you know, as a pharmacist, I have to say that I was a tad skeptical. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was approached as a training manager for Relief Pharmaceuticals to to get to grips with where um, cannabis was and specifically CBD. We will be talking about CBD or cannabidiol today. And um, I, I must admit, I was a little bit skeptical, as were my fellow medical friends. You know, when we launched our range around South Africa, a lot of pharmacists and doctors that came to the, to the trainings were very skeptical in the beginning. But through education came perspective. And I think everyone walked out realizing, aha, uh -huh, okay, it, th this is something, as I say, an idea whose time has come. It's really something we need to explore. So we'll be doing a little bit of low flying today. I'm just taking it as a, a okay. Um, 
cool, cool. I'll just um, do there we go. There we go. So there we go. So from from my perspective, just to, to touch a little bit on the regulation, a little bit about cannabis and uh, CBD, et cetera, and, um, and then how it works in our, uh, in our bodies um, as far as the uh, potential benefits is concerned and, um, and the rethink range. So just, yeah, so just really to clarify that it's not all smoke and mirrors. So from a regulatory update, where are we? I think, Mark, you just touched on it there, the September 2018 Concord ruling. I think that was very significant in terms of cannabis as a whole. And then obviously in May 2019, uh, from our perspectives in, in, in the pharmaceutical game, we and, and those that want, we wanted to bring CBD products to the market, this was very significant when the Department of Health, under the recommendation of uh, South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, which is SAPRA, said that certain cannabidiol products could be brought to the market under strict conditions, maximum dosages, 20 milligram per day, not more than this 0.001% of THC. That's tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's the one that causes the high or the psychotropic effects. And then no wild and wonderful disease claims because it's not a medication. This is a health supplement. So low risk claims um, per, per se. And that was put in place for a year. And they've actually just updated this uh, now in May 2020, amid COVID, and added in the fact that a sales pack cannot exceed more than 600 milligrams. In other words, a month supply. And they also looked funny enough at cannabis and they descheduled de it from schedule seven to schedule six. And except under certain conditions like industrial use, but not for human and, and, and animal use, um, as I mentioned, the products that are processed with less than 0.001% uh, THC, and then also for personal and private use. So I think that leans towards where we could be going with the Concord ruling and the update now uh, go, going forward. So it'll be interesting to see. So I call it the three C's. And believe it or not, even a lot of our pharmacists and uh, medical people around the, the country are, are really confused as to what cannabis is, uh, what a cannabinoid is, and certainly what CBD is. So let's just touch on it very briefly. Um, I come from the winelands. I stay in the beautiful winelands of South Africa, down here near Freitjuk, and I love red wine. And um, so, Jane, if you came to join me, you'd say, Sean, what red wine do you like? What cultivar? And uh, is, it, is it the Merlot or the Cabernet, you know, or the Pinotage? And similarly with cannabis, it has different... A lot of people sort of say strains, but it's really a cultivar or chemivar. And so a hemp strain or cultivar of cannabis would have, by um, delineation, 0.3% or less of this THC concentration in it. And a marijuana plant or marijuana cannabis plant would have more than 0.3% dry weight of THC in it. And I think they use THC purely because of the fact that it has this maybe psychotoxic and psychotropic effects. It's, not, it's not, not a good or bad situation. It just is, is situation. And I think because of everything that's happened in the, um, in, in the world and, and you know, the, the, really the misunderstanding about cannabis, they use that so that your CBD product could come from a hemp plant but not from a marijuana plant, for instance, overseas. So it's important to understand that there are different, many different varieties. Um, the concentration of the active ingredients, if you want to call them that, or chemical compounds, these cannabinoids are found in these little hair-like structures, these glands in the flowering head of the cannabis plant. And, um, and there are many of them. There are over 144 of them. But specifically, we know that THC and CBD are very, very popular right now. And a lot of trials are underway. Um, I think I saw there's over 900 trials or clinical trials on cannabis alone and many, many on CBD on its own. And what is CBD or cannabidiol? So it's one of these cannabinoids um, pr produced by the cannabis plant. And it has many health benefits, which is really exciting for me as obviously being in, in the pharmacy game for the last 30 years to see the incredible amount of uh, health benefits that it has. And that's just not even talking about disease claims. It's talking anecdotal stories and people's responses to using cannabinoids and how they work in their body. And believe me, it's not an easy subject to broach because it works in probably 60 odd different ways in the body. But the one thing that it does is it works on our little system called an endocannabinoid system, which was really discovered recently in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I like to call it the Goldilocks zone because this is an easy way for me to describe it to my 91-year-old mother who's using cannabis, by the way, CBD, um, and, and alive and well. And, um, and the reason being is, is that like Goldilocks, she didn't want her porridge too hot or too cold. She wanted it just right. And the same thing with our system. We don't want our temperatures too high or too low or our blood sugar too high or too low. We want it just right. And that's really the role of the endocannabinoid system. It's all about homeostasis. And it consists of these three parts, really a, a, a lock, if you want to call it, the receptor, 
which they discovered were in our brain and in, in our body, different receptors, CB1 and CB2. And the keys, which they discovered, wow, we've actually got our own cannabinoids in our body that are, that are manufactured. One of them being very interesting for all the long distance runners out there, anandamide, coming from the word bliss. And that causes a runner's high. So if all you poly shorts and comrades runners, you, when you get that runner's high, you are producing more anandamide, your own cannabinoid inside your body. And that's kind of the key that fits in the lock. And then enzymes that help with both the synthesis and breakdown of um, of these cannabinoids. And again, what is it doing? It's really bringing about a sense of balance in our body. We've had it all along since Paul fell off the bus. We had the endocannabinoid system, which was just named that when they discovered it in the 1990s. But we've always had it. And it's about bringing that sense of balance or homeostasis. Anybody uh, experienced a little bit of stress in the last six months? Well, I've been taking my CBD tea, my relaxed tea, uh, because I want to bring about a sense of homeostasis or balance in my body. So yeah, as Mark mentioned, there's a myriad of um, health benefits. Specifically, I'm talking obviously with regard to CBD, but THC will come later, no doubt. It will happen when, when, when we explore that from a medicinal point of view and it's legislated. But it's CBD right now, um, I probably get the most questions of what can I use this for? Will this help my conquest of the bonkers, Sean? And um, that's not a disease, by the way, just as a, as a what's the name? But it's it just, no, no it won't. Uh, I can't say that, not within the current legislation, but it may help with health maintenance and health enhancement and the relief of minor symptoms, but not unrelated to specific diseases and lots of sports people. And I think pain and anxiety are the two key ones that we get a lot of uh, requests about, all about homeostasis. Mark touched on this so nicely. I mean, this isn't even my field of expertise, but within the hemp plant, a multitude of uses for this. Very exciting to see where this, where this is going to go in terms of just the hemp plant itself and what it can be used for, industrial uses, et cetera, et cetera. And then because of those uses, there's going to be a huge amount of job opportunities. I just see within our, our, the scope of ourselves, you know, you've got Afriplex, you know, manufacturing, we've got distributors, we've got sales reps on the roads. There are people out there that involve the regulatory and the quality control. And of course, then also um, research and development, which brings me to the Cannabis Research Institute of South Africa. And it's well worth, you know, just going to their website, cannabisresearchinstitute.co.za and looking at what they do as they bring collaborators together in all different fields. And they research and development. And I think going forward, as they're pioneering this relatively new, um, the developments of new drugs and medicinal and cannabis and uh, kind of drugs down the line, is very, very exciting. And they're like a, a little bit of a third-party verification institution as well. So we, we're pleased to be endorsed by them. We have a range of different products. And I think this is important for those of you who are wanting to use a product or maybe get involved in the, in the, in the value chain somewhere, provide value across the chain, in, whether it be capsules or oils or teas or shots, provide your consumer with the ability to choose something that is suitable for them. And sometimes that might be a an isolate CBD product, sometimes it may be a broad spectrum product, but I think more specifically, most people ask me, Sean, what should I be looking for in products? And it always comes down to safety and quality for me, safety and quality first, then obviously the range of products, et cetera, et cetera, and cost effective options, make sure that it ticks the legal boxes. And after that, the sky's the limit. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, technology sometimes plays up. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sean. I think some of those, those insights of yours are really, really fascinating, especially from a medical and pharmaceutical point of view. Our next guest is Bronwyn Williams. She's doing our next presentation. And Bronwyn is a trend translator and future finance specialist for Flux Trends. She has over, over decades experience in marketing management and trend research. And she's working predominantly with brands in the financial and B2B industries. She's pursuing a master's degree in economics through the University of London. Bronwyn is our futurist for this discussion and she'll look at what role cannabis could play in rebuilding South Africa's economy. Over to you, Bronwyn. Good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna be taking you on a slightly lighter look at the world of cannabis and all of that and how it can relate to the South African market. So hopefully you'll find something interesting what we have to say, particularly if you are looking to get into the industry and to take advantage of some of those consumer trends that could actually result in new business opportunities for our local market. 
So I think the first thing to notice is that this window of opportunity of opening up for business is quite a small window and that we do need to be fast movers if we want to take advantage of this emerging, growing, global opportunity that is on the horizons. Fortunately for us in South Africa, we have very good growing conditions, so we should be a nation that takes advantage of what's going on in the world. That said, it's great that our legislation is slowly opening up and allowing businesses the opportunity to participate, but there are also some risks here. We have to be realistic. We know that we are operating in 2020, which is probably the most constrained economic conditions that pretty much any businesses have had to operate within the last, within in this whole century, indeed. And there are risks that our government could look to perhaps re-regulate this industry a bit more or to maybe extend taxation to these new burgeoning industries in pursuit of trying to find some money to keep the economies going. So there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a sort of a warning on the horizon there that we shouldn't become too complacent with the fact that we are opening up legislation. It's not a trend that's necessarily going to continue in that direction. And in fact, this week we actually saw some news coming out saying things like, you're allowed to consume cannabis products, but you're not allowed to buy seeds, for example. And that's also a little bit concerning for us as trade analysts when we start looking at how we can democratize this industry. Because already, as the previous speakers have spoken about, being in the health and pharmaceutical industry, there's already a lot of regulation and red tape that is required before you can start participating in this industry. And regulation obviously favors the bigger, better funded businesses. So we should be very careful when we try and start structuring policy around this industry that we are supporting smaller businesses and enabling more new entrepreneurs to create businesses and to create jobs. Now, what's particularly exciting about this industry is when we look at business industries and opportunities, we can essentially see there are two types of businesses that you can create. Either you can go into the business of accelerating value extraction, and we see this a lot with all those platform businesses we see across the world, things like your Amazons and your Apples and your Ubers that create marketplaces and essentially create efficiencies for marketplaces. But at the same time, they tend to extract a lot of value from the marketplace and concentrate it in quite few hands. On the other hand, you've got different types of business models and industries that are really about expanding value creation these are businesses that actually create the products that are sold in these platformized and financialized type businesses that are doing so well in the stock market. And looking forward to the future, we definitely need more businesses being involved in value creation in the real economy, not in the nominal economy. Unfortunately, the cannabis economy does exactly that. It can be a huge source of creating new jobs in an economy that could be looking at an official unemployment rate of over 50% before the end of the year. So that's just a bit of context on why we think this industry is so important for our market and for building a more sustainable, more inclusive South African economy going forward. That's it. There's quite a lot of competition in the space. Everyone and his mum is jumping into this industry because it has such high potential. In the South African context, some analysts have said that the cannabis economy could be worth, if we get our legislation and our regulation right and we support industry, up to 100 billion rand a year, which is huge in particularly constrained economic times like we find ourselves in now. Globally, looking towards the end of the decade, as some of the previous speakers have spoken about, this industry globally could be worth something like 57 to 59 billion dollars. So it's definitely a huge opportunity to participate in. And as such, we're seeing a lot of businesses, not just in the agricultural or in the cannabis space, but really from all across the market, jumping in to try and take advantage of what we're terming really the green rush. So it's like the new chasing, instead of chasing after gold, we're chasing after this new crop that could have such a huge potential to actually kickstart quite a stagnant global economy. And just for an example there, to show how everyone really is getting involved in this market, we can look at even the Church of England has suggested that it's going to invest some of its rather deep pocketed funds into the cannabis industry. They announced this last year and there was quite a lot of controversy about that. You know, what's the church doing getting involved with this? But it is becoming a legitimate business and it's not something that should be taboo anymore. We need to see it as being a valuable industry, much like the wine industry is for us and for our economies today. 
Another way to look at how different industries are tapping into this, not just in the obvious agricultural and manufacturing supply chains, is we can see how very, very big businesses, companies like Microsoft, have got involved with the tech side of this industry by tapping into the, the really growing industries around fintech, around insurtech, and around regtech. We've seen big tech companies supporting these businesses by providing support services. So we're talking everything from sort of seed to sale connected crop services that can monitor and optimize crop production to very, very clever problem solving. And that's, of course, what business opportunities always are. If you can solve a problem, you've got a business opportunity on your hands. One of the smartest things we saw in that fintech, rich tech space was how Microsoft got involved to help businesses in the United States deal with cash collection, because as the cannabis industry had been legalized, it was legalized at a state level, first not at a federal level. And that meant that traders and businesses that were selling and trading in these products were unable to bank their profits because banking was regulated at a federal level where the legislation hadn't quite caught up yet. So what Microsoft managed to do was create a very smart system to bank cash at a local level. And we think there's definitely opportunities there for smart entrepreneurs and people in the tech space to get involved with connecting this economy to make it more efficient going forward. So we definitely encourage young entrepreneurs to look at that and to try to see how we can connect FinTech, RegTech, InsureTech, and all those wonderful things to this new market too because obviously the biggest opportunities tend to be at the intersection of different trends and different technologies when we look ahead. Another opportunity or big macro trend that taps into this whole green rush economy is the whole concept of the circular economy. This is about making economies and making supply chains more sustainable from both a social perspective and from an environmental perspective. And one of the things that we've definitely seen based on 2020 itself is how business owners that are involved in corporate property, these are your property owners that own all that office space in the cities, are under a lot of pressure at the moment as more and more people are working from home and as of course the economy contracts. We've got a lot of this really prime real estate that is looking for different ways to create yield for those owners. So when we start tying this green rush economy in with some of those trends, we can also see how across the world and even locally, this inner cities are being more and more connected with agricultural products, bringing humans closer to the goods and services that they use, and also finding ways to reuse property space. Everything from growing urban farming to rooftop farming we're seeing, even to repurposing things like parking garages that people are no longer able to fill with commuters as more and more people are using, say, sharing economy transport services to get to and from work. So once again, we encourage entrepreneurs to look at the intersections of all these trends to find the niches that can create value to support this new economy and solve some rather unusual problems at exactly the same time. Then I want to go into just a few of the consumer trends that entrepreneurs could look at if they're looking for opportunities in this space. I just love this little picture over here of this poor little kid. Gone are the days when you can just set up a lemonade stand in front of your mom's house. These days you need to have fragmentation of service. You have to offer organic versions and sugar-free versions and grass-fed versions, you know, to, to please all of your more and more demanding customers that all have their own needs, desires, and wants. And we see exactly the same thing in the consumer space. Before I go on, I think it's important to note that globally at the moment, the retail consumer of cannabis, that would be the recreational cannabis user, still accounts for two thirds of the global cannabis market, that enormous growing market that we're seeing creating jobs and services and businesses in places like Canada and across Europe. The medical cannabis officials sort of the, the medical usage of the product is still only one third of the market. So that is an opportunity to grow. But right now, if you want to follow where the demand is, it really is at that direct to consumer level. And that's why we pull out just a few trends over here that might stimulate some conversation or some ideas as to how you can tap into those consumer trends to build some quite exciting businesses. The first one would be to follow on from exactly that, that whole concept of consumers demanding more fragmentation, more personalization, more tailored products that meet their own personal desires, needs and wants. 
and just how personal we are talking about now as we get into the point where businesses in the cannabis space are actually conducting DNA tests. So, so customers actually send in a urine sample, they get a DNA test done, and they get a report back saying what strains of cannabis that customer can use to treat underlying health conditions. So they do a full body analysis and also what strains they can use to get a perfect high if they want to go down that route too. So that's how personalized we're talking about when we're talking about fragmentation and personalization. And obviously if you're a good marketer, you have a bit of creative thinking behind you, you can start to see just how many products can spin out of that sort of thinking. The next consumer trend worth talking about, because we are still in August, we are still just in Women's Month, is this whole concept of the growing market for marijuana for moms in particular. So there's a huge female category that is emerging, particularly in, in the USA. So we're talking about products being designed, specifically as the last speaker was talking about, for calming, for anxiety, not the high THC, but the more high CBD products to help working moms cope with stress. And if any of you have been stuck at home with children over the last six months, you might understand why these products would be particularly attractive to women who are trying to juggle several different lives within the space of one day. Also in that female category of the product, we're seeing things like even marijuana infused tampons to help with menstrual problems at, the, at, at those specific times of the month. So it's quite interesting to see how once again at the intersection of different consumer tribes and trends, we can see whole new product categories emerging that many different entrepreneurs are taking advantage of. And as always the case is you want to be the first mover into the space we want to, in South Africa in particular, make sure that we are keeping some of these value add into consumer branding opportunities within our continents and within our country. As the previous speakers were saying, we definitely don't want to be a country that just ends up growing a crop as the farmer and not actually taking advantage of that whole value chain of opportunities that are existing out there. And then one last trend in terms of the, the human consumer is this whole concept of the rising trend towards teetotalism, that is people that are no longer wanting to consume alcohol. Of course, if you live in South Africa, we were not allowed to consume alcohol for quite a few months, so some of us have got used to that particular problem, but there is a global trend, particularly among young and health conscious consumers, to move away from alcoholic beverages, and they're looking for alternative ways to relax and enjoy a, a new vice to enjoy with their friends that doesn't involve alcohol. Alcohol is becoming less popular because of its health concerns and also because of how it can actually affect your, your weight loss or your fitness goals because more and more people get more involved with those fitness trends. It makes sense that these sort of market shifts are happening. So what we're seeing now is that younger people and young brands are creating alternative products to alcohol that use cannabis products to give that user their recreational buzz. So we're seeing everything from what you can see on the screen there. This is a US-based company that now sets up cannabis bars at weddings and corporate events. So instead of having a champagne bar, you will have a cannabis bar there instead. So once again, seeing how creative entrepreneurs can get. As they're saying, cannabis is now the new champagne. And of course, all these strains are tailored made for the bride and groom quite often they do sort of a proprietary wedding blend and then you can use that as your as your little like take-home gift for your guests too so once again quite interesting to see all these different trends and all these different unusual business opportunities arising and taking advantage of the movements that are already happening in society and then one more trend that I think is worth speaking about is the rise of the pet economy. So the pet economy is currently, I think, two times the size of the cannabis market. People spend a lot of money on their pets. People that are having children later in life that are having smaller families are tending to lavish more time, attention and vast amounts of cash on their pets. And we're starting to see an emerging category of exactly that, potable pets, things like CBD oil to treat various different animal ailments, to relax animals down. So the people that were paying for pet Reiki before would now be prepared for, to pay for CBD treatments for, for their precious animals too. So once again, a luxury market, maybe not for every single consumer, but we thought it was worth mentioning just to see how the intersection of these growing markets across the world when they collide creates entirely new product categories once again.
And then just to close off with, I think coming back to the point I opened with, is that when we look ahead, if we want to take advantage of all these weird and wonderful opportunities in the space, from the quite bizarre, from the pet economy, all the way through to the much more serious applications of this in the medical space, we really need to make sure that regulation and red tape is enhancing the ability of the industry to compete and not disincentivizing that competition and that growth. Because the opportunity is, of course, for this market to create more jobs for more people and to build a more inclusive economy. We want to get to a point where the public sector and the private sector are working together rather than working apart. And definitely what we've seen over the last few months in particular is perhaps there has been too much of making enemies between these two different camps. Whereas, of course, regulation should be supporting industry, not holding it back. And hopefully regulation will be developed in such a way that even small growers and solo entrepreneurs will be able to get involved in this massive opportunity. And it's not an opportunity that ends up being left only to the biggest businesses with the deepest pockets. So thank you very much. That's all you've got from me today. Thank you very much for that, Bronwyn. Some really fascinating ideas there. And uh, I can't quite believe the Church of England has already jumped onto this bandwagon. So Tim Harris is standing by next, uh, and he's going to discuss the next angle that we are looking at. He's homing in on the Western Cape region in particular, uh, looking at how it can be repositioned or positioned as the medical cannabis hub of South Africa. Tim is the CEO of Westgrow, the tourism trade and investment promotion agency for Cape Town and the Western Cape. And uh, he previously served as an MP and a DA shadow finance minister. So he holds a master's in economics from the University of Cape Town, and he's going to delve into this angle for us. Tim, over to you, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Joanne. So we, we, I'm going to be talking about uh, Cape Town and the Western Cape as a hub for this growing industry that you've heard uh, from our other colleagues on the call is coming. Um, it's an interesting idea talking about uh, a hub at the southern tip of one of the least developed regions on earth. We don't have geography on our side when it comes to positioning ourselves as a hub, but we certainly have many other factors that I want to talk to today. One of them being the natural beauty of Cape Town that's positioned us as probably the leading tourism economy of Africa and one that we're very confident will come back strongly uh, after the crisis that we're currently in. We're positioning for a strong growth in many sectors, ideally led by tourism, because in the end, having an attractive destination is becoming the best way of growing new sectors and attracting new investment with uh, globalization and the rise of digital and services economies people and skills are moving to desirable places. Uh, and that is the underlying argument for all of our hub uh, strategies. We're obviously positioning Cape Town and the Western Cape as a business hub for the continent, but also solving problems like connectivity by working directly on getting more flights into Cape Town International. And we're confident that our flight network, which we've doubled in the last five years, will come back strongly as well after COVID. So Westcro is the agency that helps make all of this happen. We, we work for the governments of Cape Town and the Western Cape uh, doing tourism, trade and investment um, promotion. We uh, talk about the Cape economy being one of the largest in Africa, which underlines that, that, that hub argument. If you look at our output versus other countries, we are the 12th largest on the continent. Cape Town alone is the 17th largest on the continent. And up until the COVID crisis hit, really strong economic performance in the Cape relative to the rest of South Africa, helping to raise South Africa's growth rates and lower South Africa's unemployment rate. And part of that story has been the, the, the success of Western Cape agriculture. People don't realize we are responsible as a province for about half of South Africa's uh, agricultural exports and about 40% of our agri-processed and food exports. This means we, we're, we're the fifth largest exporter uh, in Africa uh, measured against the countries of the continent. And amongst our export for performance is, of course, the wine industry. We sell about a million bottles of Western Cape wine around the world uh, every day. And that is, puts us in the position of eighth in the world for wine uh, production. So clearly, this uh, agricultural capability 
uh, links up with our logistics capability through the airport and our ports uh, to drive this export success in agriculture. So the question is, what does it take to take a historical agricultural success in agriculture and turn it into success in cannabis? Well, firstly, it takes uh, regulatory reform. And many, we've covered quite a bit of this today, but this is our summary of how quickly the regulations have changed. The top line is the regulatory timeline that started to unlock the potential uh, for this market, and it, it, it progresses at an even quicker pace, uh, thankfully, uh, helping to create an economy where before there was simply criminalization. From our perspective, you can see that bottom line sums up how West Grows approached this. We started being uh, uh, receiving calls from investors who were interested in the cannabis economy in around October 2018. And we, we hosted our first cannabis event January last year. And it's funny to think back to that event. Some of you might have been there. It really felt like a kind of covert uh thing people were there was a lot of laughing a lot of nervous giggling it was it really felt like we were dealing with something that if our parents found out about it we'd be in trouble uh, and it's amazing how quickly that has changed and now we've had multiple cannabis events on the back of the first licenses being awarded to uh, cape companies things like the first cannabis pizza going on sale in cape town uh first retail store we've now had multiple events where it just becomes more and more credible including that canatech event in november uh last year which was really a showpiece of the of the broader cannabis economy so we've had an industry that's gone from being very much in the shadows and very much clandestine to very much front and center and a potential job and investment driver for not only the Cape, but also South Africa and Africa. So how, how does, where do those jobs and investment come from? Clearly the value chain is extensive. Uh, it's it got significant length and breadth. And the big development for us in the Cape is that we've finally in the last few uh, weeks got into exports. This was one of the steps that we uh, were anticipating taking the fledgling cannabis industry in the Cape and internationalizing it. And we, we're pleased to have worked with some of our companies who've succeeded in cracking the export market for the first time uh, recently. So <clears throat> part of the reason why we think is uh, we have the potential to become a cannabis hub for Africa is of course that agricultural uh, historical uh, capability, but also what we have in the medical space in Cape Town and the R&D research uh, science and development space across uh, the Cape. That includes obviously Stellenbosch University, UCT, CPUT, UWC, the strongest universities on the continent, but also uh, significant corporate players in the agri space that have uh, attracted major international interest. We've, we've seen uh, Pepsi buy Pioneer Foods in the last few months. Uh, and of course, uh, significant medical expertise, but both in terms of uh, primary and advanced um, medical capabilities that are leading on the African continent, matched up with those research capabilities that you can see on the bottom left there. And this is part of the reason why many of the sectors in the Cape are emerging around, say, technology. So you're seeing uh, agri-tech emerge between the historical agriculture success and uh, uh, tech, the tech companies that are innovating now in the agri-tech space, or uh, biotechnology, or fourth industrial revolution companies. Having these diversified sets of corporate expertise helps you to use technology to play the convergences to create new sectors. And that's exactly the reason why we think the, the, the offer for Cannabis Hub of Africa in the Cape pivots off our historical successes in agriculture, medical, and R&D. People in, immediately assume South Africa's offer is about uh, historical capabilities growing cannabis uh, informally, about sunshine, about agriculture. But actually, we believe if you want to be a hub, you have to combine all of those with world-class R&D and medical expertise. Our investors are responding to this uh, value offer. You've seen uh, one of our unnamed investors reflecting on our certification uh, capabilities in South Africa, our infrastructure, and really the, the, the strength of our institutions in South Africa that support investors. And they're incredibly resilient even in the face of some sometimes very difficult politics that we face as a country. Then, of course, uh, other uh, Canatech reflecting on our agricultural history and the regulatory space. 
uh, and law firms reflecting on on the the export market that can emerge from countries like South Africa, uh, and they're reflecting on a country like Colombia having similar uh, underlying attributes to grow an export market. And certainly, these uh, attributes have reflected in some really very encouraging uh, firsts out of Cape Town and the Western Cape. So we had the first license granted to Africlex in con collaboration with House of Hemp in Durban. Uh, I understand Africlex were also our first exporters. Uh, it's getting into that game in the last few weeks, followed shortly by Felbridge. Uh, the Zepp is outside Stellenbosch. Um, we've also begun exporting, and we've got many other players, uh, such as uh, Kansan and, and others, being in the news for their production capabilities. So you can see it is a diverse uh, ecosystem, multiple players uh, led by companies who are really taking our industry global, uh, like Afriplex. So the team that we've got at Westcrow also reflects the different capabilities that we believe uh, this emerging hub needs. Firstly, that agriculture primary and agri-processing capability is an uh, investment mandate that we hold on behalf of the Department of Agriculture in the Cape. Amanda Shire runs that team, helping uh, to grow the industrial base on the back of our agricultural capability. Then uh, Mandy Swanepoel, she's our health tech ecosystem manager, and cannabis is becoming a much bigger part of the health and biotech offer in the Cape. Karen Bosman, she's tackling the regulatory space, helping to make sure that, that our companies are supported in dealing with the very complex and very fast moving regulatory environment in South Africa. And Dean and Cooney and his team uh, helping grow exports, which we believe will become a bigger and bigger part of uh, the market for our producers. So what do we still need to achieve our potential? Uh, clearly, we, we have to finalize the regulatory frameworks. Uh, this includes uh, rational or, or rather putting clarity in the gray areas, uh, making sure that commercial hemp becomes uh, a, a practical reality for South Africa. We get a lot of inquiries about uh, hemp that we have to, at this stage, um, turn down. We need to tackle that industrialization strategy that um, deals with the full spectrum of the supply chain. Thirdly, it, we're very much looking forward to the Cannabis for Private Purposes Act that's in the pipeline. And lastly, and most importantly, as many of the speakers have reflected on, making sure that as this industry de develops from nothing, it develops in an inclusive way. And the benefits of the new industry of cannabis uh, have as broad an impact as possible across our economy. This means there'll be roles certainly for every province in South Africa to play in the cannabis economy. We believe that the Cape Town and Western Cape can become the hub for corporates, uh, for growers, for producers, for exporters in the cannabis economy on the back of our agricultural success, our, our R&D, scientific and medical success, and our ability to already be one of the top export economies in Africa. These are all fertile ground for the growth of this new sector and Cape Town and, and the Western Cape emerging as its hub. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you for that. And I want to thank all of our speakers who painted quite a vivid landscape of what is possible in terms of creating a competitive cannabis growing economy in South Africa. So we're now going to move into a panel discussion for the next few minutes, roughly half an hour. And, and Dani Nell, manager of, uh, managing director of Afriplex, is going to join the panel at this point. Let me tell you a little bit about Dani. He founded and manages the Afriplex group of companies with key investments in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic and food industries. I think Tim alluded to the, the type of business that Afriplex is already doing there in his presentation. And uh, essentially, Afriplex is a licensed cannabis process with a sustainable source to shelf approach to patented uh, to contract manufacturing rather and Donny specializes in setting up innovative companies with patented technology so his field of study is also metallurgical and chemical engineering uh, welcome to the panel Donny and uh, please remember that uh, if you are watching right now we have a live chat function and if you haven't made use of it already you're more than welcome to do that you can just type out a question there uh, please tell us which panelist it is targeted at and uh, we can put that question to our panelists for you. Uh, just post your questions there. As I said, specify who they're for. I'll do my best 
to get through as many of those questions as I can in the next half hour. So I, I want to start off with this, and Bronwyn, perhaps you can kick off our, our Q&A section for us. It seems to me it's really the large manufacturing giants that are going to benefit immediately from uh, the formalization of this cannabis economy. How do we start bringing smaller players who may have the inclination but may know nothing about the business into this whole uh, market? Well, I think the first thing to do is have conversations like this to actually encourage people to understand what the opportunity is out there. So I think that knowledge and education go a long way to getting to that point. I also encourage once again to put it back into the, the public sector's court to make sure that we are not only issuing licenses and, and creating a regulatory environment that is prohibitive for smaller players to get involved in. So perhaps there needs to be more communication on what the opportunities are for someone that wants to start up business just for themselves even, or from a micro entrepreneurial point of view, because that's where the jobs are going to come from at the end of the day. This is where we see globally, the job creation is coming from, from smaller players, not necessarily from large companies, but there are also opportunities for smaller players to work with bigger businesses and to plug into those supply chains. So once again, we put that ball back to corporate SA's court to say, you know, are you in involving smaller businesses in your supply chain? Because obviously everyone is connected in this economy. So are we just, and just to make sure, of course, that we are also supporting other local businesses and trying to keep this economy as circular and sustainable within our own borders as possible to make sure as much value and jobs and, and all that creation stays within, within our society as we possibly can. Sean, let me bring you in here. I mean, Tim spoke very eloquently about how formalized this industry has become in the Western Cape in particular. I'm not sure whether there is perhaps a stigma in other places in the country and whether people are afraid of starting to grow this product because they just don't know enough about it. Joan, you are, you're absolutely right. I think it's not just a stigma here in the Western Cape or South Africa, it's, it's globally. And I think if you look at the trends um, historically, I mean, in the mid 1800s, um, cannabis products were in the pharmacopoeia, you know, the pharmacy Bible, as it were, you know, they, they, they were referred to for various medicinal and therapeutic uses. But they went through this process of maybe prohibitions and being taken out and, and, and we, we're coming back rather rapidly. So I think a lot of it's got to do, as Bronwyn said, is with regard to education. Uh, Tim alluded to the Canatech conferences. There's many other conferences. I'm on webinars just about weekly, if not twice a week at the moment from across the world. So even consumers can get, can you know search for these things, get educated, fo follow companies that are pioneering and innovative and on the leading edge. Um, you know, look to see, I've been on TV, on radio. I know there are many other companies that are doing the same, putting a lot of money behind marketing in order to educate not only the consumer, but remember, I, you know, I speak as a pharmacist as well. You know, the pharmacist out there is being ap approached about a subject that they, they were never trained on. <laughs> you know, I was trained in the late eighties, but I, I guess maybe current pharmacists might be going through that. And, and, the, and the same can be said for doctors. So there's a lot of education that needs to take place because when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And right now, yes, there is some skepticism, but it's very easily eradicated if we, if we, if we bring about some education. Um, a question that uh, I'm going to throw out there, this is from one of our viewers today. Will this industry be accessible easily or will it only be accessible by people with huge quantities of capital? And, and that ties into a question I wanted to ask about the KZN economy, for example, that they're trying to kickstart. They're offering farmers there about 23,000 rand uh, per project to get it off the ground. Uh, I know nothing about the what it costs to kickstart this kind of industry, but that to me sounds like a very small amount of money. Uh, Donny, would you be able to comment on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Joanne. Um, I think the the problem with um, uh, small farmers and, and small businesses in, in the supply chain in, in this um, new economy is exactly that uh, we've not created a business model and a supply chain that makes it easy for them to enter this, uh, th this economy. Uh, I want to use the example of um, the, the plant Artemisia anua, where the active is Artemisia, which is very similar to what we're dealing with now with cannabis and where the cannabinoids being the active is exactly the same. Now, in the case of Artemisia anua, it's a very well-known plant used for the treatment of malaria. Um, now, what you f find is after 20 years in, in that industry, 
there's the, the, the bulk of that plant is still being produced by small farmers. So it's exactly the same as what we're dealing with cannabis here. The current situation is actually, actually quite difficult for the small farmers. And you're quite right. You know, 20 or 30,000 Rand for um, a cannabis producer to start producing in comparison to the 20 or the 50 million Rand that some of the cultivators has already invested in cultivation facilities in South Africa. How do you, how do you compare that to, how can the small farmer produce the same quality? Forget about the quantity. How can you produce the same quality as a medicinal product compared to the 30, 50 million or 100 million investment by a, a commercial cultivator? But I think the opportunity is there to rectify that. And that's why I use the example of the Artemisia Anwa. Uh, in, in Madagascar, the 90% uh, of all uh, of that plant crop is produced by small farmers, but they produce that and supply it into an integrated supply platform. And the quality criteria uh, for them are being managed from a bigger platform and allowing them to participate. And we're not there yet. Um, we as Africplex, we've made the decision to, to procure not only from the big commercial cultivators, but also from the small farmers. And we are engaging with them. But is it, is it a challenge? Is it difficult to get the small farmer uh, to that level? Yes, uh, but I think with time we will find processes and protocols to roll out and to assist those farmers without the assistance from the bigger players in the industry that will not work. Um, if you take that you know, the 25,000 grand, it may be better to spend maybe a million or two million on one small farmer and give him a better chance of success and then with time bolt onto that small farmer in a business model where the other small farmers can latch onto the, the, the knowledge base that created with that farm. But, but I think it will come with time. Tim, I want to put a multi-pronged question to you just based on what Dani has said to us a moment ago. And, and the first issue is the kind of support that small farmers need, right? And, and you uh, have put together a very interesting ecosystem where the universities are involved in the science the education around this issue. So if you'll touch on that for me, please, and then uh, just speak very briefly about access to markets as well. Yeah, thanks. I, I think that's a very strong uh, uh, start by uh, Dani there. I, the only thing I would add is, is that, that there is a, a very simple agenda that we could adopt as a country to help accelerate the, the kind of um, the inclusive factor, if you will. Uh, the, the regulatory environment is understandably um, evolving, and but also the barriers for entry are, are really high. You need um, to pay quite a lot in order to get a license. You need uh, to invest quite a lot before you can legally start uh, being active in the space. Um, so one of the things that you could do to Im improve inclusiveness is, re re is reduce those barriers. Also, I spoke about uh, hemp earlier. Um, I think hemp will will certainly not require the same level of of kind of good uh, agricultural practices or good manufacturing practices or the high level of kind of pharmacological standards um and so there's a lot more inclusion potential in that mar market uh and and that's not really the focus of the agenda right now if you if we accelerated uh, uh the hemp market we could uh, get um, broad based benefits here and then also the recreational market that that's uh, may also require different um, pharmaceutical standards and, and could probably accommodate many, many more small scale growers. Um, so I think th th there's a lot resting on the, on the regulators here. There's also a degree to which there's a, there's a, a kind of race on. Um, you know, there's many countries across the continent with uh, ample sunshine and, and strong agricultural practices. Um, you really need to become a first mover. You really need to get the regulatory space sorted out so that you can start growing and start production uh, with, with relatively low uh, entry requirements. Because once you're established in the market, uh, it, it, you, you tend to retain that leadership um, position. So on your question of, of exports, this, this really pivots off being able to uh, get those factors in place. Um, we're really excited that exports have happened already in the last few weeks. Uh, we think there are major opportunities across uh, Europe, Asia, uh, North America. 
Um, but again, you, there, there was clearly a kind of overproduction over the last few months out of the, the Canadian market. Um, and, and it shows just how the dynamics of that market are evolving. And if you're going to be a player, uh, you have to have your ducks in a row on the regulatory side. Otherwise, you're going to be beaten to the market um, by other new entrants. Um, so really a, a lot resting on the doors of industry in terms of procurement and supply chains, as you mentioned, but also on the, on the government side as far as regulation goes. Thank you for that, Tim. A question for you, Mark. What is the process for independent licensed cultivators in South Africa to network through your platform? So I'll just unmute myself. But uh, yeah, so independent cultivators. Um, so we want to be able to, to help and create a platform, a, a space to talk and a space to collaborate and come together, um, but also to stitch them together with the, the processes um, and going back upstream, back to the scientists and the, the research and development. So I think the more we can have a forum like this and then more, uh, I guess we take the aid for that ourselves to, to create a point of contact, to create some harmony and unison and, and uh, I guess, as I pointed out in my presentation, that it's important that we work together on this to create something big and something great and something scalable. Uh, I think it's difficult to, to leave people to their own devices, get a little bit of government funding, funding from elsewhere, and expect to create a, a long, sustainable business. And I think if we can, we can pull together and draw from expertise, and, and really, over time, we'll, we know the industry will go from not existing to something great in, in five, ten years, but if we can, work together on well, that journey, you speed it up and you create scale quicker. Um, so yeah, we, we believe so to create a marketplace and, and create a space to talk. Thanks for that, uh, Mark. Uh, here's a question and I'm going to ask which one of you is, is most suitable to answer this one. But one of our viewers asks, how the cost and reliability of electricity affects the viability of growing indoor pharmaceutical grade cannabis? Sean, could this one be for you? Johnny, I think uh, I think this on the growing side and the manufacturing side might just be uh, your one because it's it, it, it is a challenge. Yeah, uh, Sean. Yeah, thanks for um, passing that ball to me. <laughs> yeah, I I, I think uh, you know the especially indoor facilities uh, are dependent on um, high energy input, um, other than the sun when it's grown outside. So the cost of electricity and not only the cost of electricity, but also sustainable electricity is absolutely critical. If you move on in an indoor facility growing cannabis and you have a power cut, uh, like, like we've experienced very often in South Africa, you have serious trouble, which means that you effectively need to double up the uh, power supply to your facility by means of generators of other means or solar and battery systems to secure uh, your crop. If you lose a crop, uh, it will set you back a uh, year, two, three years, and obviously impact on the viability of your project. So yeah, it's it's critical. But we we there, there's also other ways and means to to re reduce the risk when uh, some of the cultivators moving more to the greenhouse uh, type of of designs for their facilities, they less um, exposed to uh, the risk uh, with respect to uh, electricity cuts. But overall, uh, energy is, is key, and we're already seeing in the US and Canada where uh, the cost of electricity is, is obviously high, uh, that some of those facilities become um, uh, non-economical, and, and electricity, the cost of electricity is absolutely one of the key parameters there. Dani, thank you. I'm going to come to, to Bronwyn next. Bronwyn, this is a question for you from one of our, our viewers. What do the clients in South Africa want? Who is researching the South African market? Research is key for market access and it develops creativity based on necessity. All comes down to what the clients want, says one of our, our viewers. 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if there's too many agencies that are focusing on this specifically, but it is definitely an area that we at Flux Trends have been looking at for some time. My partner, Dion Chang, is probably one of the, the, the top researchers in the space. He was talking about this from around about 10 years ago. We actually started talking about how this industry was starting and incubating. So if you're interested, you can head over to our website there for some more information at fluxtrends.com. But absolutely, it's something that requires consumer insight, as I was talking about in my pre presentation. If you're looking for opportunities that actually suit small SMEs, so a lot of the discussion today has been talking about the growing side and the manufacturing side, but not necessarily about the value add side. And I try to present opportunities that show how entrepreneurs can capitalize on that value addition side, on the marketing, branding, packaging, and creating of finished products by tapping into the various different consumer trends going on in the world. And there's so many different ways to sell these products. We're not just talking about the medical sector. We're not even just talking about the recreational use. I think as the first presenter was talking about, Mark, he was talking about all the different things in terms of even like fashion products and biotech products and building materials that can all tap into that. So I would definitely encourage people to look at the sort of broader picture and not just focus only on the one end of the value chain, but also on the other end where the margins might be higher, but there's also more space for smaller people to get involved. And there's this regulatory hurdle to get involved in that value addition, branding, packaging, creation side of the industry. So hopefully that goes some ways towards answering your question, but I absolutely agree. Follow the market. That's where the value is at the moment. Two thirds of this global market is direct to consumer to that retail end user. There's plenty of space to play there. And I don't think South African consumers are even comfortable purchasing these products yet because the regulatory space has been so sort of, as you said, there's a stigma around this industry, but as it becomes more acceptable, there's a huge market to tap into right there, direct to consumer. Sean, a question for you. How far are we with local development of CBD extraction in South Africa? Currently, we're reliant on exporting buds and having to import the CBD back to South Africa on US currency. That is correct. And I know there are a lot, again, I don't, I don't want to default you, but there are a lot of players out there. So in terms of uh, importing uh, CBD, that is where we are currently. But with licenses now being produced with regard to cultivation, etc., I think we're not too far away from, from bringing it in lo locally now and having it locally. Um, and, and I suppose that that, that will also uh, tend to drive the prices down a little bit going forward in the future um, as competition grows and, and uh, the local industries export a little bit more in terms of extraction. I know ours does definitely come from, from, from overseas, yeah, so that we are against the, uh, the Rand dollar or the Rand euro. Uh, Mark, a question for you. Uh, first of all, how do you prevent oversupply in our market once it, it really gets going? Yeah, exactly that. And we, we've touched on what happened in Canada and it's been mentioned a few times that you have this oversupply issue. If you, if you put too much effort and energy, too many entrepreneurs creating the, um, the flower itself, um, which drives price down. So we, we saw that happen. Um, I'm sure we'll see it again as the industry expands. You get natural price discovery as you try and get the dynamics right between the amount of cultivation, uh, the amount of crop, the amount of product required, um, and where we feel we, we fit in with that expertise being the only fund of its kind. If we're working with the bigger players across the value chain and, and bolting on small farmers to that and small entrepreneurs and, and businesses, and we, we can have the data analytics um, tap into technology as well to provide those metrics between the demand elements and the supply and try and really keep that um, supply chain as, as tight as we can. Uh, and therefore we can really you know, stabilize price to a degree uh, and also stabilize the supply. Tim, here's one for you uh, from one of our, one of our viewers says, I've spoken, I've spoken with, uh, with some contacts on the due diligence for investing in cannabis farms in Lesotho, and I've received some feedback that there are high reputational risks associated with investing in Lesotho compared to South Africa, especially related to being able to export the product. Do you believe this is the case, Tim? Well, yeah, I'm not, I, I, I won't comment on that uh, particular uh, perception. What I will say is Lesotho was first out the blocks uh, in terms of granting a license to grow medical cannabis. So, I mean, it is, you know, you've got to give them credit for, for, that, for being that far-sighted and that, uh, that quick to market um, because they're now a player in this, in this market because they, they, 
uh, got ahead of the curve. Um, so we certainly deal with many investors who, who are looking as, at the Sutu as part of their, their operations. But I think that that question does underline um, the kind of investment case that, that we present in Africa. And, and frankly, we're, where we're becoming quite used to bad news uh, in South Africa, the, the, the case for investment still remains incredibly strong. Um, most of the investors we're dealing with at Westcrow are interested in investing here as a way of tapping into the wider African market, which is seen as, you know, large already and growing significantly because of the demography. Uh, and then when they look at places from which to access the continent, there are some challenges like um, uh, Mauritius and Kigali and to an extent uh, Nairobi, even possibly Lagos. But but the, the truth is South Africa still offers a, a, a reassurance and a credibility in terms of infrastructure and institutions that is unparalleled on the continent. And and then obviously within the South African investment case, we, we, we like to bring up all of the elements I spoke about in terms of the, the CAPES uh, capabilities. Um, but I do think this is not going to just be a, a South Africa story or a Western Cape story. Uh, clearly, you, you've got different uh, elements of the value chain solved in different ways across the continent. I think possibly one of the things that the question is getting at is, the, is how capital intensive investment in medical grade cannabis actually is. I think people don't realize this. They think sunshine is a, is a key input, which it absolutely is. Um, but clearly, if you can't keep your energy supply up, you run into some of those issues you spoke about a little bit earlier. But you, you also you, you need sophisticated agri-tech, biotech uh, capabilities. You need to be doing traceability. Uh, you need to worry about what sort of pesticides you're using, um, the, 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 the capital around lighting, irrigation, greenhouses. This is a seriously advanced uh, space. And, and clearly, if, you, if you're investing in that way, with that capital intensive uh, uh, investment, you, you're looking for markets where you've got a clear return, but also there's um, a, a kind of reassurance around uh, the safety of that investment. And that's clearly something that, that we focus on in the investment case uh, for Cape Town and the Western Cape. Um, Mark, certainly Tim is making some very important points here about the kind of things that could could make this an attractive investment destination for, for international investors to, to develop this growing economy. Tell me about, about the factors that, that are actually most or least attractive to, to investors who might want to put their money into these projects. So, for example, are they worried about uh, lack of, of constant uh, supply of electricity? Are they worried about labor strikes? What, what are the main uh, the main sort of uh, obstacles to getting these international investors uh, throwing their money? Yeah, I think you, you've named some of the key points. If you've got uh, an unreliable energy supply, you, you don't know whether you're, you've got a stable workforce and uh, yeah, political factors that, that can engage um, domestically. Uh, I think international investors are looking for some reassurance and some guidance that they don't, they don't live in South Africa. Um, they see the potential, like we're talking about, that uh, the industry will become something substantial. Uh, South Africa is well positioned in, in Africa as a whole to, to do well out of it. Uh, but they need some, some, some guiding hands, I think, to, to throw external capital into South Africa, pick one or two companies and expect them to do well. I think you, you need people on the ground. You need individuals who understand the marketplace and a few other players uh, to get involved and where capital is deployed. And uh, I think. I've been in South Africa for 10 years now, and South Africans are very resilient people. I think if you're working uh, in, together with, with each other and you make plans, uh, I think investors are looking for reassurance to mitigate risks. And as part of what we're putting together, it's a uh, diversified portfolio across the value chain and, and all these different factors that touch on the, the cannabis plant. Uh, so investors, I, I think, will appreciate not all their eggs in one basket, that's a sensible economic theory. Um, but also the capabilities of investing through a fund for uh, things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which the fund can, uh, can help with from an impact investment perspective, where not only do they understand that their capital is being deployed and allocated correctly within country, um, but they're ticking a lot of boxes in their, their home countries as investors as well. Uh, so we believe that we can uh, provide an impact and, and do that through our platform. Um, which we'll be looking to, uh, to sort of roll out towards the end of the year and into 2021. 
Thank you, Mark. I'm going to start wrapping up now, but I, I just want one comment from each of you, please, if you will, uh, as to where to here, if we're serious about making the cannabis economy a reality in South Africa, what are the immediate interventions that each of you would put in? May I start with you, Sean? Um, Joan, I think I'll come back to my to my point on education. Um, you know, just on the on the call today, we've we've touched on various words uh, uh, throughout this uh, this whole cannabis industry. You know, and and I know that a lot of consumers out there would be uh, very confused as to what this is all really all about, the differences in cannabis, etc. And and also, as I say, the the role players out there in the medical industry, doctors, pharmacists, etc., right across health healthcare practitioners, right across need to be educated. And I think from our perspective, that's what we take very seriously. And then coming through to the, the idea of quality control at all stages, because it's all about safety. And um, and I actually think it's a very safe industry if well regulated, but with uh, still allowing the, the players to play. Donny, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, if you would allow me just to come a circle back to uh, to the question that you had about uh, this uh, local CBD production, um, I can confirm that we've produced the first CBD in the last couple of weeks uh, from uh, locally produced cannabis. So that was uh, quite a big um, uh, objective for us, uh, which means that we could now start with uh, import replacement. Uh, so in uh, Sean, in, in future, you may get your CBD from a local source. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the, the limitations uh, for us in, in, in this industry, I think we've, we've mentioned a number of times the regulatory framework. If there's not more freedom uh, allowed to, uh, to produce certain products um, and, to, and, and to export products, then we'll be uh, severely limited in, in, in our capacity to export. Because quite frankly, South Africa is... Uh, it's a very small market compared to what we want to achieve with this economy. We can't rely only on a local local market, which means it has got to be export of, let's say, uh, plant material or ideally finished products. And the regulatory framework is the one that will uh, uh, dictate whether we succeed in, in doing that or not. The other important factor, and uh, Sean and the other uh, uh, speakers also alluded to that, is that the quality of product. Uh, we, we have to fix uh, the quality of products available in the market. Just to give you an indication, we've, we've analyzed over 200 products over a period of 18 months. We find that more than 70% of those products were actually unsafe for use, not because of the cannabis plant and the active ingredients, but because of the level of contamination. Contamination uh, uh, caused by insecticides, pesticides, solvents used by backyard operations, uh, uh, producing extracts, which is not good for this industry. It exposes uh, the consumer to those products, and there's no reason why that can't, uh, can't be fixed. Uh, in the, uh, why, why not buy your product from a pharmacy uh, in, in, instead of from your next, next door neighbor? We have to, to, we need both the regulatory um, uh, business environment, and we also need the cre recreational. I think quality is going to be key to address it, especially on the recreational and the more informal sector. And, uh, and webinars like this and, 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 and sharing information, I think is, is going to, to assist that quality becomes that driver uh, and, and ensure success. Because whatever we, we apply, quality-wise in the medicinal side, if that can flow through to the recreational side, then the consumer, who is also just happened to be the grower, can be assured that there's a safe product that's being consumed. So I think if we do the same survey in a, in a year's time, uh, hopefully we will see far better results. But quality is, is, is a key driver here. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm running out of time now. Bronwyn, your thoughts on this? Yeah, just definitely echo what Sean said about education and knowledge dissemination. The more people that know about the full picture of the opportunity all the way across and up and down the value chain, the better. And then I think that there's also an opportunity to, to discuss that value addition side of the market, to talk about branding and ownership of some concepts and ideas. Thinking ahead to the future, there's going to be some country in some region that comes up whatever the champagne equivalent is for the, these particular crops. And like we've got rooibos here in South Africa, what are the brands, what are the intellectuals 
pitch or the property, what are the products that we can actually own here in this space, where the real margin and value is. So seeing it beyond just being a commodity and looking into the bigger space, I think is definitely something we should be having more conversations around. Lovely, Bronwyn. Thank you. Tim, how about you? So uh, three quick things. Firstly, we, we, we're relying on a lot of history here, thousands of years of indigenous knowledge in South Africa around the use of cannabis and quite incredible growth since I think the first hemp brand in Africa was Hemporium in 1996. And since then, we've just been on this uh, aggressive growth curve with companies like Af Afripex leading our, our presence on the global stage. To really capitalize on that, we, we have to speed up the licensing framework. All of, almost all, as you've heard, of our product is imported. So as quickly as possible, we need to fill that with local supply. And, and the last point is, is we haven't spoken much about COVID, but this, this sector is incredibly COVID resilient. It pivots off agriculture, which has had a very good crisis in terms of those supply chains remaining strong and open, uh, and also the medical biotech space, which is booming because of COVID. So, so clearly, those two uh, fundamental sectors position this sector very well for growth, provided we can uh, speed up the regulatory issues. Thank you very much, Tim. Mark, I'm going to give you the last say. Brilliant, thank you. And um, yeah, echoing uh, government legislation framework is key. I think the government can support with rolling out friendly legislation towards the industry, but can also support by um, capital towards the industry. Uh, really, development finance is required uh, both domestically and internationally to scale South Africa up and take advantages we've been talking about from being one of the first movers uh, using the local expertise, building businesses here all requires capital to, to create to medical standards. Uh, if you want to put something into your body, you want to know exactly what's in it uh, and adhere to those standards across it. So we need capital to do that. Um, and yeah, potential investors can visit us at oso.co.za and we'll have to engage with them um, and talk more about what we're doing from the fund perspective. Thank you so much for that, Mark. And thank you to all our panelists, Sean, Mark, Dani, Bronwyn, and Tim, really lovely having this conversation with you. Very special thank you to our audience for joining us today from different parts of the country. I'm hoping this has planted a seed or concretized any ideas you may have about becoming a participant in this economy at its multiple levels to boost our economy. And thank you, uh, those of you watching and who participated, thank you for your excellent questions on the subject as well. Many thanks to Business Day and Reflex for making this discussion possible. I wish you all a fantastic day. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind you that this uh, webinar will be available on this page. It'll also be available on the Business Live YouTube page as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day from me, Joanne Joseph. Goodbye.